as we wait. I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning. If you feel comfortable doing so, no obligation, but if you feel comfortable doing so, let us know in the chat uh, what town you're joining us from this morning. That's always fun. Uh, and as uh, folks continue to file in, and uh, perhaps a few uh, take us up on our offer to let us know where they're joining us from, uh, we'll get started here. So my name is Robert Hayes. I'm the Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services at the Tewksbury Public Library. And I want to thank you for joining us uh, this, after, this morning. Uh, I also want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Public Library for providing funding for this morning's program. And I want to thank the Libraries Working Towards Social Justice Collaborative, and in particular, the Andover and North Andover Libraries uh, for partnering with us and helping us out this morning. Uh, before I get to the good stuff and introduce our guest speaker, I just want to go over a few things um, just to set, set people's expectations. I anticipate this morning's program lasting approximately an hour or so. Uh, we'll go probably till about 1130. And um, we will have time for questions at the very end. So um, feel free during the presentation to type questions into the Q&A box. And um, I'll make sure that um, they're addressed at the very end of the presentation. Um, uh, so uh, additionally, uh, feel free to make comments in the chat and those will be monitored as well. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, you'll all be receiving an email from me with a link to a feedback survey. Uh, please uh, take the time to fill that out. Uh, let us know what you thought of this morning's program and what you'd like to see for future programs here at the Tewksbury Library. Uh, and if you're from Andover or North Andover, I'll also make sure to share the results uh, with those two libraries. Gosh, I think that's about it. Um, I will uh, plug a few upcoming programs in the chat, but I'll do that once uh, the presentation begins. And uh, we are in webinar format. So again, um, we won't be able to he hear you or see you. So you'll want to communicate via the chat and the Q&A. All right, so let's get to the good stuff. Um, this morning, we're talking about interracial friendships and youth obstacles and possibilities. Uh, we're joined by Professor Chinzia Pika-Smith to learn why interracial friendships are so rare in both children and adults. We're going to explore the systematic barriers that exist in our communities and in our schools that mitigate the formation and maintenance of these important bonds. We're going to discover the benefits of interracial friendships, including decreasing prejudice, reducing outgroup anxiety, increasing cultural competence, and expanding pro-social behaviors. And uh, following Chintia's presentation, uh, based on her many years of extensive research, as I said, she welcomes questions from the audience. So Dr. Chinzia Pika-Smith, Associate Professor of Human Services and Rehabilitation Studies and Director of Assumption University's Women's Studies Program, has published widely on interracial friendships in children, how these friendships can be supported in schools, and how social justice education impacts all youth. Um, Pika-Smith is the co-author of two books, Intercultural Education, Critical Perspectives, Pedago uh, Pedagogical Challenges and Promising Practices, uh, and Social Justice Education in European Multi-Ethnic Schools Addressing the Goals of Intercultural Education. And again, I want to thank the Friends of the Library for sponsoring, and I want to thank the uh, Libraries Working Towards Social Justice Collaborative for all their support. So let's give a big virtual round of applause for Chinzia for joining us here today. And uh, Chinzia, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you to the libraries working towards social justice, both for organizing this important initiative uh, and for inviting me. I, I'm honored to be here with you today uh, and to share my work, my thinking, and uh, hopefully some, some conversation uh, with you as well. Um, and thank you too to the North of Boston uh, libraries who obviously uh, work together on this, on this initiative. Um, I, I am full of gratitude. Um, all right, so let's begin. Um, I am obviously, as Robert uh, said, going to be talking about uh, cross-race friendships today. Um, why talk about uh, these friendships? 
Uh, I'm going to give you a little roadmap of, uh, of uh, what we'll talk about today. And I think uh, Robert actually <laughs> did a great job uh, introducing uh, all of the things that I'll be covering today. I'll talk a little bit about the context in which these friendships occur. Uh, their prevalence, the developmental trajectories that these relationships take, the benefits, the myriad benefits, um, children's perceptions of these friendships, whether or not they're actually engaged in these relationships, uh, what they think of them. Um, and then we're going to spend a bulk of the time of today's presentation on youth's voices. So I will share with you both excerpts of interviews with young people who are in these relationships, um, as well as uh, excerpts of uh, written narratives, uh, some of them uh, from students of mine. And then uh, we will conclude with uh, some thinking about what happens in our schools. Now, obviously, cross-race friendships are informed and impacted by relationships that happen in the home. Uh, they're impacted by parents and parents' attitudes. They're impacted by neighborhood and, and uh, community context. They're impacted by institutions such as the library and what happens all around children. Um, but my area of research is primarily within schools and that's why um, I will be focusing on that context. So um, first of all, uh, why focus on, on this topic? Well, friendships are absolutely critical to how children mature their understanding of themselves in relation to each other and to the world around them. It is through these important bonds that they learn to practice intimacy, affection, companionship, perspective taking, all of these fundamental to social, emotional, moral, and cognitive development. Cross-race friendships in particular are the friendships that challenge socially constructed boundaries of race, they challenge stereotypes and assumptions about in-group and out-group. By crossing these boundaries, youth challenge and forge sometimes deep, meaningful relationships with each other that are also difficult, as we will hear later in the presentation. So cross-race friendships are important. And as Beverly Tatum notes, they are essential to racial reconciliation. These relationships happen in a very difficult context. Consider that in a 2019 Pew Research Center survey on race, six in 10 Americans say that race relations in the US are quote, bad, and few see them improving. 65% of adults surveyed say that it is currently more acceptable to express racist ideas in the United States. Now consider this, 56% of adults see that being black in the United States hurts people's ability to get ahead. And 51% of adults say the same thing about being Hispanic. Now, Neighborhoods in the United States are racially segregated. Daycare centers, therefore, are racially segregated. And according to the UCLA Civil Rights Project, nationwide, our schools are on average more racially segregated today than they were in the 1960s. And this is a major concern because, of course, these are the context in which our children have the opportunities to grow their friendships, right? To make and grow their friendships. In 2013, the Pew's Research Center American Value Survey found that 75% of white adults have entirely white social networks 
with no people of color within them. Now, these adults are our children's parents, teachers, school administrators, models, right? So this is a significant aspect of the context in which our children are attempting to make their own friendships. Now consider this, in 2015, the Yale Child Study Center conducted a series of research study with research studies with preschool teachers that demonstrated that implicit racial bias impacted the assessment of these teachers, even with the youngest children. Preschool teachers in the study were more likely to closely monitor preschool black boys than any other child by gender or race. When they were told that a child on video was going to misbehave, using eye scan technology, researchers were able to monitor that teachers were following the black child, were more likely to follow the black child around the room. Now, expulsion rates in preschool are four times those of K-12 expulsion rates, and they occur disproportionately by race, with BIPOC children expelled at higher rates, a trend that of course continues into K-12 settings. And implicit racial bias is an important contributing factor. So once again, our children, all of our children, children of color and white children are seeing this all around them. Now, intergroup friendships are rare cross-culturally. They're rare in the United States and they're rare across the globe. Research in the United Kingdom, Canada, other European countries, Australia, reveal similar trends. So that's the context in which we are studying the rarity of our children's cross-race friendships. So it doesn't come as a surprise that children have low rates of cross-race friendships, right? There's, there are few opportunities for these friendships because we live in segregated communities. Children go to school in mostly segregated spaces. And we see that adults themselves have very few cross-race friendships, right? So what's the literature on children? Well, again, low rates of cross-race friendships. Children have significantly fewer cross-race friendships than they have same-race friendships. Children begin to show a preference for same-race friends in preschool. So even in um, spaces where there is racial diversity, children begin to show a preference for same race friendships. Same race friendships increase while cross race friendships decrease as children develop and grow older. Now, an exception is with children of color. Children of color have more cross race friendships than white children. They still have less than intra or same race friendships, but they have more than white children. Now, the benefits of cross race friendships are many, many, many. There is a robust research and, and literature on the fact that cross race friendships and the children who are involved in them experience great benefits to their social skills development, their cultural competence, and a decrease in prejudice. So a decrease in the level of prejudice, reduced outgroup anxiety, reduced perceived vulnerability. So these children feel less vulnerable, less anxious when interacting in diverse contexts, when meeting children across difference. Um, and then of course, in terms of social skills, increased social emotional competence, 
increased cultural competence, increased levels of positive intergroup attitude, increased resilience and self-esteem, as well as pro-social behavior. All of these are associated with multi-perspectivity and critical thinking. And then of course, all of this is beneficial to positive school culture and climate, right? When we see decreased prejudice, increased cultural competence, increased social skills, right? We see more positive school culture and climate. Now, in the next few slides, I will share some of my work. Um, and um, I'll say a little bit about um, how um, my work has changed over time. Um, I will first very, very briefly um, say a little bit about children's perceptions of cross-race friendships. So um, in the beginning of my um, research, uh, I began studying children's perceptions of friendship. So I reviewed the literature, I noticed that there wasn't much written about cross-race friendships and what was available in the literature was about children's real life uh, friendships. So researchers who had access to the rare uh, racially diverse spaces uh, that, there, that there were um, would survey children and learn about their cross-race friendships. Um, I became interested in understanding in all settings, whether they were racially diverse or not, how children perceived cross-race friendships and the possibility of cross-race friendships. So my research began with asking children questions about the possibilities of cross-race friendships in hypothetical situations. So I will share a little bit about that and then we will move into uh, children's voices and qualitative research on the experiences of children in real life uh, friendship situations. So a little bit about children's perceptions of intergroup or cross-race friendships. The most important um, thing I wanted to share with you um, is that when asked about hypothetical friendship situation and when um, I measured children's understanding and perceptions of cross-race friendships based on intimacy, help, reliability, emotional security, companionship, and self-validation, six domains of friendship uh, generally measured um, to, to understand friendship quality what I learned is that white children had less positive perceptions of cross-race friendships than children of color. So in my study, European American children had overall um, more negative perceptions of cross-race friendships than children of color. So it mirrored the real life friendship literature that was out there. Furthermore, when comparing young children and older children, young children had more positive perceptions of cross-race friendships than did older children. So again, the trajectory following and mirroring the real life cross-race friendship literature was such that younger children had more positive perceptions of cross-race friendships or intergroup friendships. And as they grew older, their perceptions became more negative, right? So you see African-American children have more positive perceptions then European American children, and then uh, kindergartners and first graders had more positive perceptions than fourth and fifth graders. 
And it is also a developmental phenomenon because over time, all children's perceptions became more negative. And again, this mirrors real life uh, friendship literature in that younger children are involved in more cross-race friendships than older children, and over time they decrease. Now, um, I'd like to spend a bulk of the time talking about um, the children who, and young people, young adults who are in, um, cross-race friendships and some of the uh, the thinking, some of the um, some of the voices that um, uh, I would like to highlight some of their voices. Um, some of the themes that um, I think are worth uh, sharing with you today um, are these. Friendships are important. These friendships are important. Um, yet they're challenging and they're complex. Um, so young people talked about these friendships um, often as friendships in which, friendships that were meaningful, friendships in which they learned things about each other, uh, but also friendships that were hard, that um, were difficult to navigate, that were complex. Um, children of color, um, when um, their friendship uh, preferences um, were for same race friends, those uh, same race friendship uh, preferences were uh, often related to racial identity um, as well as experiences of discrimination. So one of the things that I often heard from educators and teachers um, was this idea that all children self-segregate um, and uh, that um, when children of color self-segregate, they're, um, you know, they are uh, pushing away uh, white children. And um, what I learned in interviewing um, children of color is that when they are, um, spending time in their same race friendships uh, and their same uh, race friendship groups, um, it is to uh, experience um, a more positive uh, experience and to sometimes offset uh, the consequences of uh, microaggressions and discrimination uh, that happen in school. Friendships are developmental and contextualized. So young people understand that friendships uh, grow over time um, and that they are, that the friendships are influenced by contextual factors that are sometimes beyond their control. Um, that parents, that teachers, that adults uh, influence uh, their uh, ability to engage uh, with friends. Intergroup contact opportunities are rare, even in racially heterogeneous schools. So even in uh, diverse schools, uh, in those rare spaces that are racially diverse, um, there are few opportunities for students to uh, cross those socially constructed boundaries of race. Um, teachers, uh, youth workers, parents, um, our attitudes and our behaviors matter. Um, children often uh, talked about teachers, uh, uh, often talked about parents um, and what parents and teachers didn't do and what parents and teachers did. Uh, what parents didn't talk about um, and what they did talk about. And those are equally important. And then after school settings and community, organizing, uh, community organizations um, also featured as important uh, themes in, in the interviews. All right, so um, I'm just going to uh, highlight some of these voices and let some of them uh, really speak um, to all of us. So this is Devon. Uh, Devon um, was a fourth grader when I interviewed, uh, interviewed him. 
And he talked about the importance of these friendship, of these friendships. I think that they, and by they he meant children who do not engage in cross-race friendships, I think that they would probably have a couple of things that they like to do or something, and they will have that like for the rest of their life. A lot of different people who have different friends, they will learn a lot more things because they will have a lot more different friends, different backgrounds, and they will teach you more things. And you learn that everyone thinks like, like thinks different. So this theme came up over and over again, this idea that um, children learn from one another, learn about different ways of being, different ways of thinking about, um, about issues, thinking about family, thinking about um, friendship itself. Um, and so learning things um, became something I heard quite a bit. I think that some of the things that are good, and that of course is about having cross-race friendships, are that they can teach you a lot of things. They can teach you things you don't know or things you don't know how to do. They may have a lot of different hobbies that, that you don't. They might teach you how to do them. And then Anna in the second grade, who is involved in cross-race friendships, we talk about Black Lives Matter and Wendy's support Trump and we went to protest together. We talk about staying just friends or being chosen family. And then Atabe, you need to meet new cultures. You want to meet new people in a school that's very mixed. If you're hanging out with other people, you might just learn things about them. So again, very young children talking about the importance of expanding one's perspective, right? Now, these friendships are also hard. Um, while children understand that there are benefits to these relationships, there are also uh, challenges that are very difficult um, to navigate for young people. And if we think about it, um, it's, it, it, it's a really important thing to unpack. If 75% of white people don't have interracial friendships, consider the implications for people, for children of color. How do white children interact across race in the rare interracial spaces that we have, right? Even in interracial friendships, well-meaning, white friends are often unaware of the realities of racism and how they impact their friends. Because white adults are not talking to white children mostly about race and racism, right? We just don't, we don't have a practice of doing that generally speaking, right? Um, Many white parents shy away from conversations about race with young children. We erroneously believe that four, five, six-year-old children haven't even noticed yet. We, we have a narrative of colorblindness. We think that children are really innocent and they don't understand race. And so we don't have interracial friendships. We are not uh, comfortable engaging, especially with young children, about uh, these, uh, these issues. And so I want to tell you about a fourth grade girl named Asha. And she describes herself as a girl of color born in the United States of Haitian and Venezuelan descent. In the first grade, um, she had an interaction with a close friend on the playground and it left her crying, it left her devastated. Um, she and her friend were on the playground and they were talking about, and Asha was talking about black men being harmed and killed by police. Her friend listened to Asha's story and at the end shook her head in disbelief and said, that's not true, that is not true despite Asha's insistence that it was that black men were indeed killed and harmed by police. 
Asha's mother is a woman of color and a social justice educator. And Asha told me that her mother explained to her that many white children, especially young children, don't know about racism, about police brutality, about Black Lives Matter, and that many white parents don't feel comfortable discussing race and racism with young white children, right? So imagine the impact on Asha uh, not to be believed, uh, not to have a story that she was uh, telling affirmed, right? To know that this was in fact true. Um, and, and this, of course, because uh, many white young children are not having these conversations. Um, but of course, young white children do notice race, right? In 2010, renowned child psychologist Margaret Beale Spencer conducted a series of experiments, and there are many in the research and in the literature. Uh, but she conducted a national study, which was actually commissioned by CNN. Some of you may have seen uh, the, the stories uh, on CNN on race, children in America and race. Um, and she and her colleagues, uh, what, what she and her colleagues found was shocking to a lot of white parents who watched the series. Um, the study tested young children, uh, four and five years old, as well as children nine and 10 years old. And children were so, shown pictures of children on a color scale from white to black with various shades of color in between. And then children were asked a number of questions. Questions like, show me the smart child, uh, show me the mean child, show me the child whose uh, skin color most adults like, show me the child whose skin color most adults don't like. Questions like this, right? Now, what the study revealed is that white children had overwhelmingly white biased responses, meaning that they held positive perceptions of white children and negative perceptions of brown and black children. 76% of white four and five year olds chose pictures of the two darkest children on the scale when answering the question, show me the dumb child and show me the mean child. 66% of the older children chose the picture of the darkest child when answering the question, show me the child who most children don't like. So it is imperative that we talk to young children about race and racism because they are already thinking about race. They are already making assumptions about racial categories. And that is getting in the way of their relationships. And when they are in the rare instances that they are in cross-race friendships, their assumptions are negatively impacting, right? Without malintent, they're negatively impacting the children of color with whom they are friends. Now, this next story comes from Jenna, uh, a student um, who in thinking back to her childhood, recalls the first time she crossed paths with someone who was quote, different from me. Um, and she's talking about a black uh, friend from soccer. And when she began spending time with her, she asked her mother if she could spend time in uh, Alicia's home, if she could spend the night in Alicia's home. And her mom said no. And her mom used uh, many reasons why Alicia could not spend the night. And many of them informed in racism, right? Um, Alicia, uh, Alicia's mom was described as someone who had uh, several men in and out of her house, 
Um, and Jenna, uh, the white friend, remembers feeling confused and scared by her mother's depiction of Alicia's mother and family. She remembers feeling scared. She remembers feeling concerned uh, for Alicia. Now, she continued her relationship with Alicia through soccer um, for years. And then as she reflects as a young adult about all of these years of living under these assumptions, these racist assumptions about Alicia's family, she says, I realized that everything I had been told was wrong. But now imagine their relationships. Imagine the impact on Alicia uh, being in a relationship in, that was informed in these assumptions, right? And imagine the impact on Jenna as well, right? So these relationships are so difficult to begin, right? It's, it's difficult for them to germinate, to grow, to maintain these relationships. Um, there are so few spaces where they can happen. And then there are a myriad of, of, of things that impact whether or not they continue. And then even in these relationships, the, the impacts can be uh, the impact can be very, very difficult, especially for uh, young people of color. These, these friendships are difficult to maintain, right? Um, this is a quote from Mark. Mark talks about a friendship he had um, with, um, with Dante. I actually know racism exists and Mark is white. I actually know racism exists and I know racial profiling happens. And I know that pol pol police brutality against people of color is true. I have argued with my white friends who don't believe it. They have lived in an all white world their whole lives and haven't seen it, but I have. I remember one time when my friend Dante was coming over to my house and we were going to work on a project and he was carrying his laptop. We heard the bell ring and there was an officer at the door with Dante and he had this look on his face and the officer had stopped him on his way to my house and questioned him walking in my neighborhood carrying a laptop and accusing him of maybe stealing it. I was so angry and I felt ashamed. Our friendship really changed after that. I didn't know how to talk about it and I'm sure he wished that I had. So. These are such difficult situations to navigate and neither, and, and Mark uh, obviously found himself not knowing how to address this, 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 uh, this terrible uh, situation that happened to, to Dante, this, this incident of racial profiling that, 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 that left, uh, that, that significantly impacted Dante. Um, and, and Mark uh, could have used support. Um, and again, uh, you know, we don't know uh, the, 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 the relationship that Mark had with uh, what adults in, in his life, uh, that he didn't have the supports to understand whether and how to engage uh, in and, and process uh, uh, this, this so that their friendship could, could continue. So these, again, are complex. There are benefits. They can, these friendships can be deep and meaningful. Um, they can be really challenging. And Latrell says, some days I feel like there's no use for it, making cross-race friendships. And other days I feel like it's good and there's a use. It's hard. It's hard to explain. So again, no, no easy, no easy, wrap it in a bow sort of conclusion, right? But just layered, complex, and young people know how to say that. So 
where there is in-group preference, where there is same uh, race preference, um, I want to make the point that it can be different uh, for uh, white children and children of color. There is an extensive literature about prejudice and same race friendship, right? So in a majority white context, right? There, there's a difference between a, a majority of white children excluding a numeric minority of uh, children of color out of a friendship group, right? There's a literature that connects that to prejudice. In group preference, right, by a group that feels marginalized or experiences discrimination in a classroom setting or in a school setting, um, can be explained by different mechanisms, right? So, I want to talk a little bit about in-group preference uh, for um, uh, for the children who's who talked about it, who are children of color. When I wear my hair in braids, my white friends touch my hair sometimes, and I don't like it. And my teacher touched my hair too, by the way. One time, my friend said, "Oh, your hair feels weird," and sometimes we disagree on a lot of things. But with my black friends or my other friends of color, they would never think my hair is weird. And it just feels like more comfortable and like they're my sisters, right? So this sense of feeling solidarity, feeling safe, um, feeling like an identity safe space um, and a space free of microaggressions or discrimination. My friends that are the same as me understand what I'm going through. There's a lot of teasing in my class and kids are not gonna be friends if other kids are calling them slaves. Now, Della um, uh, was a white student that I interviewed in a, in a mixed race class who talked a lot about prejudice and discrimination in her class and uh, and was one of the students who noticed, you know, a young fourth grade student who noticed that there was not going to be, uh, there were not gonna be cross-race friendships when uh, this kind of behavior, when discrimination, when prejudice, when racism were occurring in the class. Um, and in this particular class, black children were being called slaves. Children also notice that these friendships are developmental. Chris talks about the fact that these friendships become bigger and bigger, right? And I remember Chris, Chris is a white student, was a white student uh, talking about um, the fact that be friendships begin with a handshake and a high and then they get bigger. You start hanging out and going over to his house, meeting his mom and stuff like that. So he, he really thinks about friendships from an ecological systems perspective, if you will, right? Starting and then evolving into, you know, different and different uh, systems. These friendships decrease in time. Brian explained to me that when um, children are younger, they get to be outside more. They get to be on the playground more. There's an emphasis on learning through play and recreational activities. There are more opportunities to be together um, in, in those kinds of settings. And as a focus on academics um, uh, takes center stage, um, then children have fewer and fewer and fewer opportunities to, um, to uh, engage meaningfully in the kind of uh, play that, that, uh, that leads to friendship making. All of the teachers, all of the children talked about um, teachers and, uh, and the importance of relationships within schools and, and, and the, the teachers as either facilitating or mitigating uh, cross-race friendships. 
Um, and so, of course, uh, adults are either can be uh, facilitators or barriers of these important um, relationships. Again, here we see uh, the, um, the presence of um, uh, discrimination and prejudice in the classroom and children talking about the teacher interrupting uh, what happens in the classroom. So, you know, if somebody is saying something, um, taking the opportunity to interrupt that. Also, um, young children have a sense of how to support uh, cross-race friendships that very much is in line with the literature on intergroup contact, creating collaborative opportunities, uh, creating opportunities to collaborate and to cooperate, right? So uh, Linda says, uh, the teacher can always assign partners so they can hang out, sit at the table, work together and talk. That would help because if they start talking about a subject, they would probably start talking more about other things. Like maybe when they're on the playground, they come up to each other and start talking about other things that they want to play with. Interestingly, that's what we see in the literature about intergroup contact and supporting intergroup friendships. Creating opportunities in the classroom, being mindful about grouping students in a way that they are working collaboratively, cooperatively on common goals with the uh, support of authorities, teachers, administrators, um, and giving those opportunities for meaningful contact, right, that will generalize outside of that space. Placing children in cross-race groups, however, is not enough, right? It's, it, it has to be a skillful facilitation. Um, and Chris notices this and says, I think teachers and counselors could focus on the positive things that you both like. I think they could help you because they've been through this and probably it was hard. It was probably hard for them as it is for you. So again, Chris is asking for facilitation, not just let's put children together and they'll figure it out. That's simply contact. It's not meaningful facilitation, but rather Chris is asking for a conversation, a dialogue. What makes it challenging? How do we do this? So again, there's more voices about what teachers can do and the role of after school in community settings. Sophia notices that I only see black kids or different kids at school, not at home or in my team. Again, the context, segregated neighborhoods, we are living in segregated spaces. So, you know, how, how do our public spaces, uh, how can our public spaces uh, contribute to and support uh, cross-race uh, relationships. Um, uh, here we are at the library, right? So briefly before we before we end, um, I, I've talked a little bit about the conditions, the ideal conditions that support intergroup friendships. Um, intergroup friendships cannot happen if young people are not experiencing equal status. Um, young people have to be working on common goals, working collaboratively, um, cooperatively with the support of authorities, whether that's authorities within a school, teachers, administrators, etc. Now consider that when I talked earlier about the context in which these, these friendships are formed, right now children are not uh, working uh, in, in most schools under these conditions, right? Um, there are many obstacles um, to um, the ideal conditions in intergroup contact. Um, schools across the nation um, 
the students of color are disproportionately disciplined, hyper disciplined, and when they're disciplined, they receive harsher punishments than their white counterparts. And this begins in preschool, as we saw, right? Uh, we have a robust literature on implicit racial bias of teachers. Um, in, um, we have expulsion rates um, that are disproportionately higher uh, for children of color. In, in schools, uh, students of color are more likely to be taught by less experienced uh, teachers, white middle-class monolingual teachers. Um, students of color are less uh, likely to be taught by master teachers, veteran teachers, um, and missing in the curricula uh, in most of our schools, and, and this is something that affects all children, right, white children and children of color, are uh, depictions of people of color as protagonists in the books that all of our children read. Um, and, you know, while the history, um, the culture, the literature of white students are amply represented in the core curriculum, uh, students of color's history, culture, uh, literature uh, is often relegated to occasional uh, cultural celebrations of the month. And this means that equal status does not exist because this has meaning. This has meaning for white children and children of color, right? We make meaning of this. Um, and so, you know, equal status doesn't exist. Students are often tracked um, and, and, um, and have uh, few opportunities to, to actually be together across racial identity groups, even in a larger, more racially diverse school context. So opportunities to collaborate uh, on common goals often don't happen, right? So this is really a, a portrait of systemic inequity, which doesn't support um, cross-race friendships. Um, so academic tracking by race and class, disciplining disparities by race and class, curricular misrepresentation, all of these things uh, don't make for the environment uh, that is conducive to, uh, to uh, cross-race uh, friendships. Um, and so we, we really want to fix these issues in our schools. Um, you know, uh, at, as, as the library's working towards social justice, uh, 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 are, th are thinking about uh, initiatives and, and how to make um, libraries uh, socially just. So too, um, should our schools be thinking about um, how to create socially just schools. And when we do, uh, when we create uh, opportunities for equal status, common goals and collaboration, young people will have that fertile ground uh, upon which to grow uh, cross-race uh, relationships. So in the end, my thinking is, let's not focus specifically on individual interventions uh, to support cross-race friendships, uh, but rather let's commit to a big picture uh, of creating a just context in which those relationships can happen. And with that, I think I will conclude. In this last slide here, I have some links to uh, a TED talk um, that I did on interracial friendships, an episode of Code Switch um, uh, in, that I participated in, as well as a couple of other NPR interviews, all of them on the topic of cross-race friendships, should you want to look at those uh, on your own time and think about this topic in more depth. So with that, thank you very much. So Chinzia, a wonderful job. And uh, let me read you a few questions from the audience. 
Okay. I, and I know we had said we would go till 1130, but we, we can go a little longer. I want to make sure you, you get to answer these questions. Uh, Anne says, I have a transracial family. I have concerns when I let my black children play in white homes. The concerns stem from not exactly knowing the bias and racism in that home. We all know that many people say, I am not racist, but when it comes down to it, they may and probably do hold beliefs that are not safe for my family and for my black and white children. How do we navigate this? Do you recommend speaking to the parents first about your concerns? What if this hinders our children's relationship? Due to social media, we see what our neighbors and our children's friends' families post, and it has definitely opened my eyes on who I want my kids to hang out with. Absolutely. Yes, and I, I should say that, um, so I'm going to, uh, so my, my answer is influenced both in uh, my uh, work as a professional and as a researcher. And I will share with you that uh, I, I share your concerns as the parent uh, also of uh, black uh, children as well. So, um, my my thinking is that it is important to know um, our our children's friends and the 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 parents uh, of of those friends and the context in which uh, they play and spend their time. Um, and uh, I also think that. And I, I also don't know how old uh, your your children are, but I also think, and you uh, you you probably do this, um, that it's important to um, prepare our children uh, for the uh, realities that they will encounter, um, and so having. Um, you know, doing both things, uh, both knowing uh, the context in which, knowing as much as we can, the context in which they will, they will travel and spend time, but also just um, having an open line of communication with our children so that if and when uh, they experience something that is, uh, they don't understand, something that impacts them negatively, you will be the first person that they come to to process this experience. Um, and um, that they're also prepared to, um, to deal with that experience in the moment to the best of their ability and developmentally, you know, I, I, again, not knowing um, the, the age of, 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 your, of, of your children. So, um, I don't think that we will be able to prevent, um, you know, uh, <laughs> our, our children from experiencing uh, racism and, uh, and uh, however, we will be able to help them navigate it in a way that, um, uh, that, that they will not, um, that, that they will feel that they have supports um, and that they will understand uh, what, uh, what has happened um, in that particular instance and how it connects to a larger conversation about what is happening. Uh, uh, Shinwei uh, wants to know, uh, kids ask so many questions how much can you tell a seven-year-old about racism or police brutality without making him grow up thinking the police are bad? Yeah, that's, a, that's an important question. Well, I should say that um, one of the things that I would suggest um, is, uh, you know, first of all, not having the first conversation about race and racism be a conversation about um, police brutality. 
Um, however, also using um, some helpful tools. So for example, um, this book, which may be available in your library, uh, Something Happened in Our Town, is a book for children about uh, a shooting, uh, a, a police shooting of a black man. And it is a story told, um, it, it is a story about two families, a black family and a white family, and how they each process and talk about the police shooting. Um, and it is a great way to enter the conversation um, and to do that with a seven-year-old, right? Um, but the thing that's important um, to remember is that, um, you know, children, um, children of color, Black children have known about police brutality uh, always, right? Through, throughout our history, um, they've known about police brutality and they've been part of social movements uh, at the forefront of social movements, in protests, uh, in marches. And so uh, when particularly white parents um, don't want to talk to children about these realities, it's important to think about what that means. Um, because, you know, certainly um, children of color are, you know, quite, quite familiar uh, and uh, uh, and, and understand both conversations about racial oppression as well as liberation and fighting for change and fighting for social justice. So I think um, it's really important to do that with white children. And related to that is not ending the conversation with injustice, but also continuing the conversation with social movement social justice, social change, right? So these things are happening. What can we do to be a part of a movement that works towards change, right? We can do something about it because one of the things that we don't want children to do is to feel that this is a desperate situation. It's never going to change. Isn't the world horrible, but rather to empower children um, and to say, this is something, these are systems um, that, that can change, that, that people can change systems. And you are a person, I am a person, we are people who are going to work to change the system. I think we have a good segue into Brooke's question. Do you recommend any resources for talking to preschool children about race and racism? Yes, so um, there are many, and if you want, I can um, provide you with some, Robert, and then you can share them with folks. Um, That'd be great. Yeah, and uh, certainly there are lots of different things. I would begin with talking about color and race, and you know, have conversations about uh, about that before then talking about issues of oppression as well. So starting to, you know, to talk about, um, I'm, I'm just looking here because uh, I talk with, and I read a lot to, uh, to children, but I can certainly provide you with, with uh, a list. Uh, final question goes to an anonymous attendee. Um, and uh, she apologizes for joining 10 minutes late. And you touched on this just a little bit at the beginning, but I'm interested in the impact of economically driven policies that created segregated home ownership and how this creates friendship problems for children. And just to put a little more color on it, I, I would just note that here in uh, Tewksbury, we, uh, according to census demographics, are 91% white. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Um, I, as I said, the, 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 the context in which uh, children form their friendship is the wider context is um, absolutely important to think about. So, uh, and, and which is why um, I think it's important to think um, systemically and, and not to make this about um, what individual interventions can we put in place in schools? You know, should we have 
um, you know, a lunch bunch or should we, you know, I, I, and, and certainly there are, you know, there are conversations that need to happen, but at the same time, there are bigger picture conversations um, to understand uh, why uh, we as adults uh, don't have those relationships, which then obviously influence our children. And we contextualize our children uh, intentionally in, in segregated spaces. Um, so absolutely, I, I, <laughs> you know, I, I, I agree that the conversation is, uh, uh, goes much, uh, much uh, wider and, and deeper than uh, any one context um, um, uh, and, and certainly beyond the classroom. And this is, you know, the, uh, someone in, in another presentation uh, at another public library asked, um, you know, about other influences on cross-race friendships. And you know, I speak about the classroom because that's uh, where I conduct uh, my research. But I begin the inter the, the 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 presentation with the larger context, uh, the systemic context, because it cannot be divorced. What happens in the classroom cannot be divorced from the larger um, institutional um, context, the systemic context. Excuse me. So Dr. Pika Smith, um, do you have any last words you want? I think we'll, we'll end the Q&A there. I know we have a couple more, but we'll end it there. Do you have any more, uh, any last words you want to deliver to the group? I would just like to thank you for spending time with me on a Saturday morning. Um, and uh, please, if you have, uh, if you would like to contact me, uh, I'm, I would be happy to continue a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, I obviously can't see any of you on the screen, so I'm just speaking to a, a blank screen, which can be a, a little bit odd, um, but I'm easily reachable via email and Robert has my information. Um, and, uh, and I'd be happy to, um, to uh, if anybody uh, would like to reach out to, uh, to speak with anybody. And uh, thank you for your time. Wonderful. Let's give Dr. Pika Smith a big virtual round of applause. Uh, I'll make sure to include your email in the uh, email address in the email that I send tomorrow uh, with the feedback survey. So I want to thank you for taking your time this morning for to speaking to this group. Uh, I learned quite a bit, uh, certainly put some things in perspective. And uh, I think uh, we got a good turnout and get good, good feedback uh, for a Saturday morning program. So thank you so much, Dr. Pika Smith. And uh, we will wrap up the call in about 10 seconds. So thanks so much. And uh, I'll be in touch via email. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Everyone have a great morning.